Welcome to Let's Talk, Ed and Zahi. We are talking about uh, how to venture into different modalities this week. And you did an interview with Mike Koss. Talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are going to talk about. Yeah, Mike and Mike and I have known uh, one another for a few years, and Mike is is a is what I would say always trying to be on the cutting edge. And what I wanted to know from him is how he got into the mindset of wanting to break with the status quo of how things had been done for decades. Uh, he uh, he he's wonderful at lecture capture. He he has trialed online synchronous and asynchronous over the years, well before everybody else jumped on that bandwagon. And the the, the interesting thing about uh, Mike is he teaches philosophy. So for people who say, well, it's not really for me, it's not really for my general education classes, he proves it uh, to be extremely effective. Yes, there is the personality, of course, there is the the uh, willingness to, to trial, but he's showing that uh, over the years, and he's taught at the four-year and the two-year, he's, uh, he's showing time and again that modalities don't need to be a stumbling block in front of our students. All right, let's take a look at that interview with you and Mike Cost. Mike, so what's your experience with, uh, with those alternative methods of, of instruction, especially the ones that you and I didn't uh, learn about. Oh gosh. Um, well, it's funny because alternative has almost become mainstream, hasn't it? Um, you know, I I'm, I'm trying to think back about why I got involved in all this. I I was teaching online, which you know was an alternative method of instruction, and you know I sort of felt a, a disconnect from my students. I think that was a big part of it, and just the idea of you know how do you keep students motivated and how do you use some of the skills in the classroom to get students motivated in an online environment. And, you know, text can do only so much. And uh, I started playing around with video technology uh, quite a while ago. A friend of mine told me about this thing called YouTube where that was new. And it took me about six months to figure that one out because when they said YouTube, I thought they were talking about the band U2. And I thought, oh, Bonham's got a website, that's great. Um, but once I found out about it, um, I, uh, fortunately the multimedia graphic department at the time was in my department and they let me a camera and I started doing videos and I realized, um, that the more mistakes I made, you know, the more I, uh, messed up or, uh, did something weird or, you know, had a weird shirt on or whatever, the more the students liked it. And so I found, uh, that the videos were not just a way to add a, a little dimension to my instruction, but it was a way to connect to students because they could see me as a human being. And over time, I remember we started training people. It's like, oh, you can get these handheld cameras. Uh, next thing, there were the flip cameras. And pretty soon, you know, everybody had one on their phone. Um, and so you could just pick up a phone, uh, do a video, or have somebody else video you anywhere, right? So if you wanted to demonstrate a place, I'm in Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. If I wanted to show people Scott's Bluff, I could just go out and uh, walk to the Bluff and show people the Bluff. And it's great. Uh, it's a great way to connect to students. And um, so, you know, I really, you know, got started thinking this is another way to teach because you can demonstrate things as well, right? You can show PowerPoints, uh, you can demonstrate how to do things on the computer, but I found more and more as you put your personality into the videos, it also becomes a way of giving students a sense of belonging because then they realize you're a human being. Um, it's easier con to convey that you care about them directly uh, using uh, video, uh, that, that you take the time to use the video. Uh, helps. And of course, bringing in things. Uh, I have a cute little dog who unfortunately is not with me today, but uh, I'd like to bring him into the videos and, and people will post things like, oh, what's your dog doing this week? Or I've got a dog just like this, or I've got a different dog. And they show pictures of their dogs. And it helps build a community because who doesn't like dogs? Well, some people don't, but then they put their cats up, you know, and or their hamsters or their lizards or whatever it is. And so again, you know, it, it helps us connect, you know, not just as uh, student and facilitator, student and teacher, but really as human beings uh, who have a lot in common, uh, even if we're all very, very different. And, and Mike, let's let's make it clear for people: you teach very meaty, beefy subjects, philosophy and political science, and the intersection yeah. uh, of those things. And yet, you found that putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable. 
yeah. and recording yourself help the instruction. Yeah. Well, and you know, in, in, in philosophy or in political science or, or really, you know, any of the humanities, you know, you're dealing with some pretty heady concepts sometimes, and sometimes they're difficult concepts. And um, sometimes there are a lot of questions that I can't answer. I mean, I'd love to be able to, uh, but I can't. And so, you know, seeing me kind of fumble around with that, seeing me uh, ask the question or, or, you know, provide different perspectives. And sometimes, too, in, in those cases, bringing someone else in uh, to be part of the conversation who might have a different perspective so that students know, oh, we can bring different perspectives into the course and it's OK, uh, can, can also be an empowering thing. And also, uh, you know, speaking in, in a in a hopefully you know simplified manner so the students know you know you don't have to um you know come up with complicated things um you can take these ideas and try to make them more straightforward and it's okay and it's okay to understand them where you're at rather than trying to um you know be confused all the time or or try to to go beyond um you know what you can do at the particular moment so um, yeah, I think that's been helpful. And again, um, just trying to make myself approachable so people feel okay saying, you know what, Mike, I don't understand this, or I don't get this, or the reading doesn't make sense to me, you know, things like that. And then again, I can come on, do a video, explain the reading, or say, you know what, there are some things that just don't make sense. And maybe you're getting confused by X, Y, or Z. And um, again, uh, giving people that comfort level, or even the comfort level to say, hey, I've got a lot of going on in my life, and I can't... Um, I can't complete this assignment at a time rather than just ghosting or disappearing, which is what a lot of online um, students do. Having them reach out and let me know what's going on is really helpful, too. And I try to let them know what's going on in my life, too. If I'm sick or something like that, it's like, hey, guys, I'm sorry. Um, or hey, people, I should say, hey, people, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I was late getting the video up this week because I had a cold or, you know, my dog went crazy or something like that. You know, life happens to all of us. And so you've taken your show on the road. I remember you told me yeah. uh, about a particular uh, League of, uh, for Innovation conference where you presented. Uh, what kind of information did you uh, present and what was the feedback uh, from the people uh, that you got? Were they shocked that, that somebody like yourself was teaching in this alternative method? You know, I don't know if they were shocked. I mean, you know, the nice thing about a, a conference is that the conference tells you what the, the topic is, which is nice. But, you know, first of all, there were, uh, I think, three or four of us uh, who, who went uh, teaching in different fields. And we tried to show really how we use videos to personalize our style. And so, you know, Brandon's style was different from Angelica's, which was different from mine. And so rather than, than people say, well, you know, you have to be funny or you have to do this or you have to bring a dog, uh, there, you know, Brandon has a cat, you know. Um, so uh, it was a way of, of, you know, trying to build a community. And, you know, rather than just saying, you know, sometimes I just show the videos so people could see, number one, um, they're easy to do because even I could do it. And number two, it's OK to make mistakes. You know, um, we make mistakes all the time in the classroom. We stumble over words in the classroom. We don't worry about it because we're not watching ourselves do it. Right. And so that's the biggest thing to get over. And so having different um, people from different uh, disciplines uh, showing their approach and, and how they use the videos to humanize things, I think people found really helpful. And did you find and that your students? Sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing. We included comments from students. And so we got a lot of uh, feedback from students. Love the videos. Uh, thanks for making the videos, things like that. Uh, it helped my learning. Um, and so, you know, we'd save those student comments and we would put them up on slides and, and, and discuss those as well. So speaking of students, did you find that those videos, the lecture capture approach that that you uh, followed later on, was it did it serve as a on demand support uh, framework for that student? Because that, now they don't have to recall what happened in the lecture. They can go specifically to that yeah. particular video. Yes, it did. Um, well, there's a couple of things, um, you know, and not just videos. I mean, uh, I used to podcast my lectures uh, back in the day when they had uh, iTunes U, and, and it's something that's that people still do now. I don't lecture that much, uh, but the nice thing about a lecture is if a student misses a class or they miss the notes or something like that, they can go back and listen to it, right? Or if there's something they don't understand, they can listen to it again 
And it also uh, also even the playing field a little bit uh, with uh, online uh, versus traditional classes, because online students could also, uh, you know, reap whatever benefit there is of, of seeing me in person and they can hear the lecture and, uh, you know, the same lecture that I give to uh, my classes, although I've learned over the years to edit those down a little bit, um, you know, maybe stop the pauses and, and things like that. But, you know, again, it, it gives students online as close to as possible the different modes of, of um, you know, being exposed to material uh, that they can get. And it hasn't taken sense. away from the rigor, I'm taking it, if you've continued to do it over the years, hasn't affected the no. rigor. Um, it, it, if anything, it's it's allowed me to be more rigorous because then I'm not, um, you know, focusing too much on text or too much on study guides or things like that. But I can also, you know, explain things in in uh, more detail uh, using lectures or I, you know, I don't have to rely just on the textbook. I can bring in other things. Um, using videos and lectures and, and things like that. And, and I can also encourage, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, it, it's funny. I was, um, I'm trying to remember now, I was uh, either reading or talking to somebody about assessment and they were talking about um, different levels of rigor in different classes. And somebody said, well, um, it's it, that students perceive a class to be less rigorous doesn't mean it's less rigorous. It just means that maybe they perceive that they're going to get more help from the instructor. So the fact that they know that I'm available and that I can help them probably has allowed me to uh, push them a little bit more in terms of their performance. Right. And, and when, when you push but yet support that student, have you been, uh, have you seen an impact on the change in the students who typically don't can't continue on the the non-traditionals the people who are first generation the people who are working adults or or, or have uh, dependents have you found that your approach actually helps them or to the contrary it might hurt them i don't know what your findings uh, are i think it helps them a lot because um again i talk about my life and the things that i have going on in my life and Right, I don't have children, but I also, you know, I'm, I'm an administrator now, and so I have a, another job that I have to go to or get to go to, I should say. Um, and uh, I have deadlines at my job, just like they do, and and so it makes them, I think, more open to talk to me about the challenges that they have. And so if somebody says, "Hey, you know, I've got, I'm getting slammed at work, I can't get this assignment in on time," again, instead of just giving up, I'll say, "Okay, you know, I've been in your position." Um, if you can't make it by this date, how can we negotiate a date that's going to work for you? And, you know, realize you need to keep up and here are some strategies. And so I think people feel, um, especially non-traditional students, um, uh, feel more open saying, you know, this this is going on in my life and um, I, I need to I need your help uh, prioritizing things so I can get through the class. So so you're finding that your approach. A is not, and I'm trying to summarize, A is not taken away no. from the rigor. B no. is allowing you to be closer to your students as a human before being a subject matter expert. C is supporting the students when they need the support most because they can go back yeah. and rehear it or find particular yeah. videos that supplement. And D, what I'm uh, kind of guessing is it's been a success for you because you stuck with it for, for quite some time. Be between the time YouTube started and today, there's a, you know, a good 15 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the technology has gotten better, too, which has been helpful uh, because now I know there are some concerns that people have about putting their videos out on YouTube. And so there are other platforms like Uja, for example, where it can be tied to the learning management system. And so your video doesn't have to be out there in public. Um, and sometimes students feel more comfortable with that as well. Um, and you can, you can, it, you know, there are easier ways to link materials, uh, link to materials, um, either to or from your video and, and things like that. So it's only gotten better since those, those days. And you've used it at the college and the university levels, right? Um, yes, yes, I have. And also as, as a dean, I used it I, I, during the pandemic. You know, I had the same challenge that everybody was working remotely. And how do I connect with the people uh, that I work with? And so I made weekly videos for my faculty and just said, hey, here's what's going on. Um, you know, here's what you can expect. Here are some due dates for things or uh, here are the new rules 
uh, around COVID for this week. Here's when we plan to reopen or when we plan to close down again. And um, I, the, the feedback I got from faculty was was very positive. So you can use it not just as you know, not not just inside of class, but outside of class. So you can use it for um, in place of office hours, maybe you know things like that to make class announcements. The more the more opportunities. You see, I had not thought about the office hour element. That's that's actually brilliant, and that's why talking to others is an opportunity for us to learn every single day. Yeah, and of course, Zoom now. Um, you know, you can do it two ways. So you know, it's 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 gone from being a one way mode of communication now to live streaming and all that. So there's a yeah. there's a lot that's going on and a lot more to be done. That's for sure. That's true, Mike. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure, Zahi.